Because our final speaker also has time constraints, we'll actually have the question session starting at 3 o'clock. So um, the next speaker needs no introduction so he doesn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Rob alluded to this idea of these organotypic models. Uh, he uses the terms entroids and organoids. So, I'm going to be talking about these uh, a little bit. And you've already heard a good brief introduction to C. difficile. And from the point of view of the pathogen, it is an anaerobe. And it produces these spores that germinate under the influence of things such as bile acids. But what can we know about this? I mean, Rob is already focused on this key point, how the normal microbiota kind of keeps C. difficile at bay. And when it's changed by antibiotics, C. difficile could come in and start growing. But the actual disease itself that causes disease in the host is due to the production of a toxin. And Rob mentioned that he could assay the toxin itself in his mini bioreactors. But how does that actually cause disease? Well, we already heard about the rodent models, starting initially with the hamsters, but moving on to mice. And we've leveraged these mouse models quite a bit to look at how you can have this interaction between a pathogen, the microbiota, and the host. But it gets pretty complicated when you start looking at all of these things. So how can we isolate, in particular, the symbiosis between the host and the microbe itself. And kind of, as opposed to Rob, where he's focusing on the microbiota, how about if we just take the microbiota out of the, out of the way and look at the interaction of the pathogen with the host? And in this case, it's the human host. And I know that doesn't look human, but I'll tell you a little bit about it more. And this is some work that was published last year where we started looking at toxin production by C. difficile and persistence within these so-called human intestinal organoids. And this was work that was done by my uh, graduate student, John C. Leslie, uh, who will be leaving in a couple months for a postdoc. Um, a little bit of terminology if people aren't familiar with these things, organoids, enteroids, you hear them in the literature. And I'm going to use a very specific uh, a very specific terminology because it depends on where you get your tissue. One of the things that you can do is you can use induced pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells. And we actually use embryonic stem cells. And through the process of de novo differentiating, giving them specific uh, maturation signals, you can develop this so-called human intestinal organoid in this particular case, which has both a mesenchyme and an epithelium and requires relatively simple growth conditions. Let's contrast that with if you start with stem cells from terminally differentiated tissues, such as a gut biopsy, with a very complex growth condition, you can grow epithelium only. In terms of the gut, they refer to these as enteroids. People will refer to them as colonoids if they're from colon, gastroids, lungoids, liveroids. So it gets a little weird. So some people just refer to them as organoids. But for the purposes of my talk, when I'm talking about organoids, these are derived from pluripotent stem cells, and in our case, embryonic, not induced, okay? Um, there are a number of different reviews, including this one here, where you can kind of look at the details. So again, what Jason Spence, who I, worked with at, who I work with at the University of Michigan, he took in human pluripotent stem cells, embryonic stem cells, gave them various signals to kind of differentiate them. And what he had actually hoped to do was just look at gene expression. On these, uh, on these monolayers. But what he started noticing is he just started noticing these little blebs that would appear on the monolayer. And he actually plucked them out, put them into matrigel, in other words, put them into 3D cultures, and found out that he actually got a structure that could actually be passage. You could cut it in half, it would heal, it would continue to grow. And it had both an epithelium and a mesenchyme. And the epithelium itself looked pretty good. If you look at the enterocytes, they have a brush border, so nice microvilli. Depending on what markers he stands for, there are enter enteroendocrine cells there. There are lysozyme-producing cells, or so something akin to a panath cell. They're not exactly panath cells. They would produce mucus. You actually had goblet cells that would produce mucin. And all of this in a sterile environment, about two to three millimeters. Never saw bugs, don't have bugs in it. When he came to the University of Michigan, someone said, you got to go talk to Vince. And he showed these to me. I said, those are really cool. He goes, what do you want to do with them? Well, they're sterile. Let's fix that. So let's see, can we get them to interact with bacteria? So is this a way to kind of, con you know, what we're trying to do in terms of animal welfare, you know, in particular, could this be a replacement? Somewhere in between mice 
somewhere in between, say, using a trans well or, or uh, you know, other immortalized tissues. And in particular, what we're describing is you can d develop aneroids from a mouse. These are human aneroids. So we kind of talk about the differences between human and mouse. In this particular case, we can look at human cells interacting potentially with a human pathogen. So one of the first things we wanted to do when Jason got there is he wanted to see if they actually had a functional epithelial barrier. And the reason for that I'll tell you in a couple minutes. But basically, if you stain for ZO1, it looks like they have nice tight junctions up on the apical surface of this epithelium. This is the epithelium of uh, organoid about a month, month and a half old. So what Jason did is, uh, and John C. and Jason uh, Shang in his lab was looking at taking fluorescent 4 kilodalton dextrans, typical barrier function assay. What happens, instead of just having the mice eat them, you inject it into the lumen of the organoid and see how long it stays there. And if you basically keep it in, injected, there's one, two, three, four, five organoids here. 18, 24 hours later, most of the dye still remains within the lumen. But if you disrupt tight junctions, for example, by chelating all the calcium, by adding EGTA at this point, you rapidly have a leak of these four kilodalton dextrans out, and you've disrupted the barrier. Although histologically, you look at it, and the cells haven't died. They're still there. Now, why are, were we interested in looking at barrier function? I told Jason, well, one of the first things that we want to do is we look at C. difficile, and I mentioned that toxin production was the key part. And you can get all the details. Borden Lacey has done some beautiful work on the structure and function of these toxins. But these toxins are taken up by receptor-mediated endocytosis and eventually affect host GTPases, such as Rho, RAC, CDC42, that control the actin cytoskeleton. And presumably, one of the assays is cell rounding or loss of barrier function. So what would happen if we were to take one of these toxins that can affect the cellular function and put it into the organoid. And so what John C. did is, again, you've seen this panel before of the control organoids. EGTA disrupts the tight junction. You lose barrier function there. There are two flavors of the toxin. Let's just focus on TCDA. There's some subtleties here for people who love C. difficile, but let's focus on the, the clear story here, purified TCDA from C. difficile. If that's injected at time zero here, so it was injected at the same time as the dextrans, you see loss of barrier function. It takes about 12 hours, and pretty much you've disrupted it. We can actually, I don't have the movies here. My postdoc, David Hill, we now use continuous monitoring where we take pictures every 10 minutes. And you can see in the movies that within about six to eight hours, you've had most of your uh, barrier function loss at that time. And if you look at What's going on? You know, here's the nice ZO1 ta uh, staining and occludin staining. Here in a control, TCDA basically completely disrupts that, disrupts the uh, cytoskeleton. And you actually start seeing the epithelium start having a bad time there. So at this point, John C. goes, hey, what happens if we put C. difficile in there? And I mentioned that C. difficile is an anaerobe. I said, it'll die. Nothing will happen. Well, of course. She did what she's supposed to do. She ignored her boss and went ahead and did it anyways, right? So she took vegetative growing C. difficile, put it in with the four kilodalton dextrans, and she saw at that point, within 12 hours, she lost all the barrier function. We had a tox non-toxigenic strain. It's not isogenic strain. We now have the isogenic strains here, and we've done those experiments. But at this time, we had a naturally occurring non-toxin-producing strain, and it stayed. Barrier function was maintained. But as opposed to when they had the toxigenic C. difficile, it was just as good as if you put TCDA. And it wasn't just the media, because she actually spun out the C. difficile. And if you put in just the conditioned media, she didn't get a barrier function. In the paper, that, act, that actual control's there. I should actually put it in my slides now. Um, and the C. difficile actually stayed within the lumen. It actually survived up to 12 hours. You can see them in there. Here's the, here's the toxigenic strain. The epithelium, which looks nice here with the non-toxigenic strain, which fills the lumen here. The epithelium stays there. The epithelium is lost here. You start seeing spores in C. difficile. And those people who study C. difficile know that at the time you start seeing sporulation, this kind of stress response, that's when it starts producing toxin. So that was interesting. But as I said, basically what she had, she had maintenance of the amount of, maybe there was a little dip here at two hours. We're not sure what happens. Was there a little bit growth back at 12 hours? But there was one experiment that John C. did where she put in about 1,000 C. difficile. And then she got about 10 to the fifth back in 24 hours. And I asked her, what went on there? 
And we're trying to figure out, it looks like it was actually growing. Well, as in all good experiments, there was some sort of mistake. You know, what was going on? Well, we were injecting all sorts of things at that time, and the person who was working with E. coli first didn't clear it out very well, and so she injected E. coli along with some C. difficile. And there's always this thought that facultative organisms like E. coli, when they first hit the gut, drop the luminal oxygen concentration and allow anaerobes to come in. And we were wondering, is that really what's going on? What happens if you put E. coli alone into an organoid? Does it really reduce the oxygen tension? Well, you have to measure luminal oxygen tension. We have a couple of ways of doing it. This one is a sort of a destructive way. We actually take an optode, a fiber, uh, fiber optic cable that has a tiny little optode in the end, and if you jam it into an organoid, you see that instead of the 21% atmospheric oxygen, the metabolism of the mesenchyme and the epithelium itself drops luminal oxygen to around 8%. Okay? And it's maintained if you have just a control organoid. You, about 7 to 8 percent is where the oxygen level is. But if you put E. coli in it at time zero, it will actually drop the luminal oxygen concentration. And actually, there's some stochasticity here. Depending on how many CFUs of E. coli you have per the HIO, there's a linear relationship with how low the oxygen content actually goes. So this is kind of fun. You know, we, have, we have something to do with that. We'll come back to this and some of the work that David has done in a little bit. But how else can we look at these? What is this thing? What is this epithelium? It looks like an epithelium, but what stage of an epithelium is it? You know, uh, the reason Jason has started working on this, he's looking at development and maturation. So he actually spent some time looking what is the gene expression profile of the epithelium in these intestinal organoids. And again, this is all published, so we won't go through the details here, but the short story is in the human intestinal organoids, the gene expression in the epithelium looks more like fetal intestine, much more like a juvenile intention, germ-free, actually, as if you had had someone who was just born. However, if you actually take these HIOs and you can actually implant them under the kidney capsule of triple immunodeficient mice, and they'll stay there, and if you leave them there for about six weeks and pull them out, what you see is you actually mature it both phenotypically so here's the HIO here, and the epithelium's okay. Like I said, it's kind of a cyst here, but somewhat disorganized. Dis sorry, disorganized. But if you transplant them under the kidney capsule for several weeks of an immunodeficient mouse, you actually start seeing a nice villi that you would actually see in the adult small intestine. And as an aside, I forgot to tell you that the HIOs, the way they're matured right now, are more like the small intestine than the colon. So some people have raised the question, well, how can you use them to study C. difficile? I said, well, maybe we can't. Maybe you know, we can do certain things, but maybe not other things. And we'll get to that when we get to the limitations. So again, here's just looking at some of the markers, showing that the hyos, again, you have this th sort of th simple epithelium that in the transplanted hyos becomes much more involved. You get really nice looking villi. You start seeing different markers increase in cadherin, so everything looks a little bit more like it's matured, and, and the gene expression profile goes along with that. But are there other signals? It's a lot to basically do the surgery and implant these under the capsule of the kidney. And we've also said one of the things that might be going on early on after an animal is born, after a mammals are born, they get exposed to more microbes than they got exposed to in utero. So David followed up on his E. coli observation. He says, what does E. coli itself do? And this particular E. coli strain is actually a commensal, quote, unquote, commensal strain, E. cor 2, that was isolated a long time ago when people were just looking at the basic phylogeny of E. coli. But it's non-pathogenic. Well, David, as his, during his graduate school work, was looking at IBD and looking at the role of mucus. And that's one of the first things that he did. He goes, well, when you inject E. coli into one of these HIOs, and he looked just 24 hours later. This is 24 hours after injecting E. coli. And he's just staying with PAS. He goes, wow, you've really changed the amount of mucus that's present there on the epithelium. And he likes to say that this is pretty similar to what you see in mice and in people, that if you take fetal small intestine, there's not much mucus. But shortly after exposure to organisms, you start seeing a lot more goblet cells, a lot more mucus, and we're starting to see that with the initial exposure of this juvenile human intestinal organoid epithelium to E. coli. So David has done similar to what was done before, transcriptional analysis on these organoids that have been monoassociated with E. coli. 
This is the expression profile of the embryonic stem cells that was used to make the organoids. Here's the expression when the organoid is sterile, and then 24 hours after, you start seeing a massive change in expression. And when he starts, you know, there's a lot of up, a lot of down, but when he starts focusing on some things, for example, looking at, sorry, this is a little blurry, but looking at what might be happening in changing carbohydrate modification and expression that would change the types of mucus that are being uh, uh, expressed by the epithelium, he starts seeing massive changes in this, correlating with what's been going on. And he's staying, using various lectins to see, can he detect these different sugar modifications to show that the gene expression is actually resulting in different sugars being expressed by the epithelium. And for example, he's used uh, you know, different type, looking at different kind of sialations, different expression of MUC2, syndican, and again, this is all changed by exposure to E. coli. So we're just at the beginning stages of looking at, at this model system as a way to take an epithelium that hadn't seen bacteria before, associating it with different bacteria, not just pathogens, but commensals, to begin to look at this part of the host microbe interaction. So where do we go from here? What, what can happen? Well, one of the things that's very key is this idea of oxygen. How do we actually monitor it and manipulate it? Um, what kinds of systems can we do? Can we actually grow anaerobes in there? Other than E. coli, can we do things? We have some unpublished data that one of the favorites for anyone from the Gordon lab, uh, B. theta, will actually survive and actually grow a tiny bit in the organoids and can sustain for at least 96 hours there. So anaerobes can survive in there. Can we, by dropping the ambient O2 overall, doing it in a hypoxic chamber, can we do even better than that? How do we non-destructively monitor uh, oxygen. Working with a bioengineer, they actually have uh, microbeads that actually have the fluorophores right on them. So if you inject them in there, you can continuously monitor the oxygen with inside organoids as well. I mentioned already that a lot of times when you have these, a lot of people have been looking at pathogenic interactions. So there have been papers published on salmonella, beautiful work from Manuel Amieva on H. pylori, people looking at C. diff and other viruses as well. But we also have to look at these kind of beneficial mutualistic interactions as well. We have the opportunity in this system to do that. Can we make it more complex? Can we have luminal flow? This is a cyst, so anything that goes in stays in there. Can we actually try to get these things to have luminal flow? People have been working on 2D versus 3D cultures. Mary Estes down at Baylor has used the 2D version of organoids to be able to grow rotavirus. How about mechanical stress? You know? Squeezing from the outside, you know, what's going on when it's under the kidney capsule? Is it a mechanical signal as well as having chemical signals? And then this idea of increasing complexity. There's no immune system there. We've actually added immune cells, and immune cells can actually home to organoids that have bacteria in it, but won't home to one that doesn't have a bacteria in it in the same dish. Uh, there have been recent papers looking at triggering development of the enteric nervous system putting in complex microbial communities. But the question is, how far do we go? At which point are we trying to build a mouse, right? And we already have those. Or build a person, and we already have those. And I think all of these model systems, that's something that we have to think about. When can you use the system because of its inherent strengths and not heap on a bunch of weaknesses that make it either inex just, just difficult to use, and then there are other systems that are better to use for it. So that's what we need to figure out with these organoid model systems. Where do they actually fit? The NIH has sponsored a number of groups, we're fortunate to be one of them, who were looking at initially in the gut, but now they had just a recent call and they reviewed ones that are looking at lung, looking at liver. So there's a lot of this sort of tissue engineering. In our next talk, we're going to hear about how we can look at some of these more advanced uh, model systems. So thanks for your attention. And of course, it's always the people that we work with that make us great, including all the investigators on the organoid model system and the people in my lab who do the work. So thanks.